All right, everyone, good to see you. Another week. Welcome to Political Bedlam, uh, whatever this podcast is becoming. It's a magical journey that we're all on together, and I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry, I'm very sleepy. I fell well, asleep. Let's, let's talk no, about that. We don't have to. What? Okay, well, no. we, can, 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 can we bring it up just you a little bit? can bring it up just I, a little bit. I think bit. It, it enlightens people as of the content or the <laughs> the character, or at least just the personality of our, our creators here. Uh, we were here to meet at 7. Producer Jeremy gets here at 7. Cast texts at like 6.51, saying he's on his way. Well, okay, what's going on? We get 7.05, Cast isn't here. Finally, we get a text from like 7, Cast from like 7.10, saying he was asleep, but he is on his way. What prompted you to say you were coming at 6.51, but then fall asleep? Can you explain how that happened? <laughs> Uh, I really can't. I wish I had a good explanation, but I was I was in my house. I, I was in my phone. I put my shoes on at seven forty six fifty forty five, and then I texted you at, at six fifty and was like I'm on my way while I was sitting on my couch. And then the next thing I know, I'm asleep on my couch. Okay. Well, I meant that as kind of poke fun at cash, but it sounds like it might be a medical issue. I might have like some sort of sleep issue. It's very possible. We need. We might need to investigate this. I wouldn't mind a sleep test. Okay. What uh, was that? Narcolepsy? What yeah, narcolepsy is one. Yeah. Oh, who's that? Well, she agrees. I wouldn't say it to his face though. It's not polite. It was very rude. But we are joined by our in-house guest Amelia and Ogle, um, my daughter. She's eleven months, so she doesn't really get to choose what she does or where she goes. So I've made her our podcast guest. Um, I think she's a fine addition to the team, and should you decide you don't want to be a part of it, I think she'd make a worthy replacement. I think so too. I think so too. Um, yeah, she's, she's pretty cool. She's uh, sitting in at about 28 inches, uh, 26 pounds, red hair, blue eyes. Um, Strikingly devious and charming. Fiscally, uh, she's fiscally conservative, uh, but she's definitely socially liberal. She feels real out of that. She lets her opinions be known. Um, she's a libertarian, as most babies are. Um, most babies are, do as you will. They do have a very libertine <laughs> sense of... Uh, Justice and ideology. They do. They do. They're they're uh, interesting creatures. Well, we're gonna try and break this up into a couple of segments tonight. Uh, we kind of played around with more of a pop culture feel last week. We're gonna try and retain that, but we're also gonna try and blend in more of what we were originally doing. We're still figuring out what we are. So, um, I guess we can start with off the top. Let's get the unpleasantness, or at least the, the controversial topic. Oh, Miss Amelia does not want to sit. She senses. The apprehension coming up in this upcoming topic. Yeah, she does. Everyone is talking about um, a situation at the border involving uh, detained families and separated children. Uh, it's been all over media and all over social media this week. Cass, take over. <laughs> well, I think it's nice that we've just fully embraced fascism in this country and we've, we've chosen an ideology to go forward with that really does terrify all of us except you it seems you don't seem to be quite as terrified or well I, I i think there are a lot of sensationalist claims around it um it's it's something that has existed it is legislation that has existed um but it's never been enforced well you, you say that but i mean back in 2014 that we have those viral photos that were going around that were mistakenly used in about a month ago were used about a month ago for this current crisis that were actually from the obama era uh, it's, it's popped up uh, 2003, 2014. It's popped up throughout the George Bush and Obama um, uh, eras. Uh, sorry, Millie is. She's very apprehensive about this. She does not like talking about the border. Uh, it popped up, but it popped up then. Um, it's popping up now. There are more cases that are being prosecuted. Uh, there's a new zero tolerance policy that uh, Jeff Sessions announced that they are now going to prosecute everyone who comes across the border. Um, which is the difference between the law the way it existed under Obama when it was in the, during the Obama administration. Uh, the law was only... Um, so she thinks of that, Cass. That's what she thinks of that. Um, it was only enacted when they thought the child didn't belong to the family, when they thought the, chi- the, fa- the par- adults were a danger to the child. Now with the zero tolerance policy, you have over 2,000 kids in Walmarts all over Texas and Arizona. 
it's a completely different inaction of the law. Yeah, uh, no, that, that's, that explains it. Yeah, no, Trump actually enforcing the law now. Um, the mechanism has been in place since 97. Um, but of course, with Obama and Bush not enforcing the law to the same degree, we did not get quite the same effect. Um, I, I, I bring up that being the point of contention right there, whether uh, either we are, uh, I, I don't like executive discretion at all. Either we are a nation we either we're a democracy or we aren't. Either we elect people who make laws for us and we follow those laws, or we we don't. Or we elect people that, like Obama, who can show their executive discretion and say, oh, no, screw you guys. Screw the people that you elected to make laws. Screw the laws that they made. I'm going to show my executive discretion and not enforce it. Whether it's a bad law or not, that's fine. Let's change the law. But executive discretion goes against the very principle of a democracy. That's, it's, really, that's really rich coming from a libertarian when you talk about, you know, an unjust law. Why on God's earth would you, would you follow it or want it to be enforced? Let's take marijuana, for instance. During Obama, several states legalized recreational marijuana, and he did not enforce the law. Are you saying that that is a bad Im implementation of uh, the law? Well, I, I think that's part of, specifically, um, drug law was not collected by the people. I'm pretty sure that it was private industries that helped form, um, excuse me, little one is joined limp, that helped form um, the DEA that led to the DEA, or unelected bureaucrats, scheduling marijuana as a, uh, as a I believe, don't quote me on that. We, we might have through, through, le through legal representatives declare marijuana legal. But I'm fairly sure it was through bureaucracy that, was, that became legal. Well, and it was through bureaucracy that we decided that there should be a zero tolerance policy. That was not a position that was voted on by the people. Uh, you say that. I mean, I, uh, Trump, whether right or wrong, Trump ran on that issue and Trump won. I mean, it was at least the vote of those voters. With a, with a lack of the, of, the, of the popular vote. He, was ele he wasn't elected with a uh, impetus to leave. What's the term that they always use? Uh, uh, that's not the term, Millie. Really. I think she's right. It's not impetus to lead. It's uh, I don't remember what the what the expression I'm looking for is, but but he if that's your if that's your threshold, then you're still not meeting your your criterion because he wasn't elected with the majority of the vote. We don't know by majority vote. We're not a democracy. We are a republic. We we have electoral college system because we are a republic because the states matter just as much, if not more, than the majority of people. That's the difference between a democracy and a republic. That's why, like, the majority doesn't win, and we have electoral college systems because we have representatives. Well, that doesn't mean a law can't be unjust. I mean, that, that is in, in direct contention to what you were saying about marijuana being a bureaucratic uh, issue, being something that was made illegal by bureaucracy and, and political interests rather than a vote of the people. I, I will concede that Jeff Sessions passing this and this not being something that we voted on or legal representatives for us voted on could be viewed as that, but I mean, you have to at least concede that Trump did run on this and a significant portion of people did want, did want more border security, whether for right or for wrong, they wanted it. And I, I think that kind of brings us to, we're gonna let Millie kind of crawl around. She's filling out the space, she's kind of hearing our answers and she's like, she's her eyes. She's like, guys, you guys are gonna be dead in 50 years. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna have to live with your choices right now. Now oh, she's playing with carpet. Have you, uh, Cass, have you read um, Ted Cruz's bill? Uh, was, I think I think he announced it about 24 hours ago. No, you know hours? what? I was actually reading an uh, article about the bill. I think that's what put me to sleep. <laughs> was I, was read, I was reading a uh, synthesis of the bill. So I am unfamiliar with it. Um, the headline wasn't pleasant, but that's what you could expect from Slate. So what, what, give me the rundown. As of now, or at least when I was reading that this afternoon, it was a bill where he is not planning on leveraging anything. Uh, it's plans, he wants to just pass it. He doesn't want to tie it to a border wall. He doesn't want to tie it to more border spending. It is a law that would increase the number of federal immigration judges. Uh, this, this, the whole thing, the whole point is to widen the pipeline to, to get this problem solved. It would, um, it would immediately not allow children and uh, their parents to be separated, so it would immediately address that issue. And it would um, increase the amount of time, or decrease the amount of time it would take to wait for asylum requests and for, um, I guess, just overall uh, immigration hearings to a period of 14 to 21 days. 
Um, it seems to be pretty across the board favored, except for um, the time required. It said 14 days to make an asylum case. A lot of prominent asylum lawyers have argued that is not good enough time to make a good, compelling case. So we'll probably see some changes there, but uh, I, I do think that this is a, uh, I think it's positive. I think it's, it's a good step that um, Republicans are, are at least listening. Um, oh, Millie found something to play with. She found the door jammer. Door jammer. She loves door jammers. Did she just make the noise? She made the noise with the spring. Sorry, we, we keep pausing to look over at her. She's so darn cute. It's hard not to. Do you feel all the eyes in the room on you? She's like, no. Go and talk about immigration policy. I don't care. <coughs> Without reading the bill, I can't, uh, I can't comment uh, on its efficacy. Uh, a little dead air uh, Something that uh, should be pointed out about the judges, the immigration judges, they're not judges in the sense of the, the court system. They're not part of the legal system. The judges are uh, very generically called judges. They're arbiters. They make decisions based on um, whatever the Department of Justice says they should make the decisions based on. And right now, that's Jeff Sessions. Interesting. I did not. So know. yeah, they're they're not judges. It's not like uh, uh, they're not elected. Certainly, they're not. Uh, you, you know, their uh, their qualifications are whatever the whatever Jeff Sessions wants their qualifications to be. And I'm just using him as a generic example. It could be whoever is in charge of that department. <gasps> did you find my phone? What? Go ahead. You can look at it. I'm not mad. She's crowding around the room right now, really getting a feel for things, warming up for her own interview. <clears throat> Lady but that's just a fun fact about those judges. So when you when you hear about immigration judges, don't think that they are um, judges in the traditional sense. Okay, uh, I, I never quite understood that. Um, interesting to shed some light. Uh, I brought that up more just uh, for, I guess, some flavor, context, um, just that... This issue, I mean, definitely the people are being heard on this. Representatives on both sides are reacting um, with both statements and legislation. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what gets passed. I would, I would like. Um, I think we'd all like for something to get passed as soon as possible. Um, <coughs> I worry though that it won't be. I, I worry that it won't be for for several reasons. I worry first that the Republicans are they want to appear tough on immigration to their base. And I hear a second that the Democrats uh, see this as a big political win for them. And as long as this injustice remains, that heck, I mean, people are, are posting on Facebook all the time about how unfair Republicans and how big Trump are. I mean, big political points. I think both sides have a selfish reason to not resolve this crisis. So, well, I mean, that's the problem, isn't it, is that this is not an issue that if it's not resolved quickly, we have very few options on ways to resolve it, but uh, this is by far the most egregious thing that has happened under the Trump administration. Um, and I think that people who are, who are at the very beginning weary are now afraid. Like, That's fine. We'll uh, that. Sorry. Um, Point being, a lot of people are very scared by this, and uh, you know, I think people haven't been this outraged since the, at the very beginning of his uh, administration when uh, they had the quote unquote Muslim ban. Which was not a Muslim ban. Well, it was a Muslim ban, but that's not a here nor there. Okay. Is, it, is it here nor there? We can talk about it. I mean, that. that was another thing that was just like, it was, it was, it was controlling, the, it was controlling the conversation. It was controlling the narrative. I mean, banning seven countries out of 46 Muslim nations is not a Muslim ban. It is a whatever ban. Like, what do those countries have in common? Can call it a partial Muslim, Muslim ban? Yeah, that's fair. I, I, yes, the Muslim 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 okay. Muslim but I don't think it was because they were Muslims. I never thought it was because they were Muslims back then. I thought it was because they were all hot spots in the world of insurgency and terrorism. Then why didn't we ban Saudi Arabia? Well, you, you really need that question answered. I mean, the cronyism is still exactly. going to exist in, exactly. any, in any nation. And it would have existed without him. No, that's true, but we wouldn't have had that kind of ban without him. Foreign policy means making tough choices, and that means empowering... Deciding who's got the oil. And well, I, I the... think it means it's empowering which, which players 
over in that area have the power to keep the region in check. I mean, you're not going to empower a weaker country over a stronger country. You're going to want to keep the stronger country as your friend if you can. And I think that's a good portion of what, why Saudi got it and why other countries like Yemen that have also been our, our allies didn't because Yemen's not going to, not going to help us in any, any wars the way Saudi would. But back to, <clears throat> I, back to what you were saying about how this is uh, the big point in his administration where people are... Uh, Oh, she's now in Cass's lap. She looks very happy. Here. Do you want milk? Or the keys? I think she wants keys. Okay, let's have some keys. <coughs> yes! You've got the keys now. You can drive. You can drive that car. Don't even remind me. <laughs> well, well, Cass, uh, well, try and keep... Yes. Keep it concise. Um, let's uh, put up just... Your comparison to why this, I guess, directly aligns us with fascism, and we'll both try and just put a little bow on this before we move on. It's fascist because in fascist ideology, you try to find a scapegoat who is weaker than the uh, population at large. Oh no, don't eat that. Don't eat that. Do you want to eat this? And um, the we are we are talking about the children in a way that's unhuman, people say, well, they deserve this because their parents didn't follow the law. And we are, we're valuing rule of law above basic humanity. And uh, it's nationalist. It is racially motivated. Well, what would you say to people then who are just like, okay, well, let's not detain them separately. Let's just, let's just, if they make it, they make asylum, they make asylum. If they don't, we just deport them immediately as a family. As a family, yeah. No, I mean, that's not ideal, but it's certainly not separating... It's not on the same grounds as separating children from their families. Look, this crime that they're being, that the parents are being charged with, that get them separated, is a misdemeanor. We don't stop. For for reentry is a felony. Reentry which, which might is be about ten percent. But but all two thousand and five hundred approximately of these people are reentry people. No 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 no, no they're not. They're, well, a couple hundred. Are. We don't charge people who run a stoplight, which is a misdemeanor, by separating their children from them. No, but there are all misdemeanors that will get you put in jail. There are a lot. I mean, public intox for one, a whole litany of crimes under alcohol. I mean, they're I mean, not, 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 not even for a DUI isn't going to get your children taken away. No, not in all circumstances. It's not. It's not. I, I think the the operating logic they would use though is you're going to go to jail, and they're not going to allow you to take their kids with you. The also, problem is we need to get the amount of time that this this pipeline that people are getting stuck in for months. We need to get that narrowed down to a week. Well, okay. there's a lot of things we need to do, but the thing we shouldn't be doing is separating children from their families and putting them in uh, metal cages. Because uh, we're not putting them in foster care. We're not putting them in, a, you know, a summer camp that's been converted. We're putting them in old Walmarts that we're renting out and the Waltons are getting money for. I actually can't prove that, so that's not a fact. But someone is making money on You heard this. it first here. You heard it first here. The Waltons support... Child internment. Yep. Um, I back that. This podcast brought to you by Walmart. Yeah. Thank you, Walmart. Thank you Walmart. for allowing me to live a lavish lifestyle with my pittance of income. But um, and for locking up children. For locking up children. You're doing a great job. Uh, but uh, now some of these facilities are are being rented to the government. So someone is making a profit off of this. Um, and. Uh, what? Another part of the fascist model is private enterprise uh, profiting from government uh, fear mongering. Were the facilities rented out before this crisis came up within the past couple months, or was well, government rents all sorts of stuff? I'm sure. I actually, I honestly don't know the specifics on that, so don't take that as gospel. But do take the fact that the Waltons are the Waltons support child support and child that, is, that, that is, is a gospel. hard fact. That, that is, is that's a hard fact. fact. That's hard fact. Sam Walton didn't biologically have any children. He no. stole them. He stole them all. The children came into his store, and he separated them from their parents, and he put them on the track to becoming heiresses. On the track to becoming heiresses. They're doing fine. Oh yeah. Well, some some of them, like he stole probably probably a thousand, and about five of them went on to become billionaire heirs and heiresses, and the other thousand became Walmart workers. So, and it's just it's part of the the administration's whole. Look, <laughs> that whole look is really fascist. Their weird obsession with the flag. Uh, their, uh, I mean, in a speech today about immigration, he hugged the flag after his speech. Like, well, what is that? Yeah, what is Mi that? Millie, it's weird. Millie agrees with that. Millie was watching that with me, and she just 
She's she's pretty far left. Uh, it's it's embarrassing. Um, Do you want to help me seize the means? With that red hair? She does. She, yeah. She's got the red hair. She's like, Dad, I don't want to hear your capitalist pig talk. She's really, really, really anti-capitalist. Really What's up? We discovered a uh, phrase at work today. Um, <laughs> cas- caspitalism? It's um, it's basically the opposite of the Robin Hood principle. It's whatever you... It's the worst kind of capitalism. You give you give to the rich the stuff you stole from the poor. That's capitalism. And it's the most... Ethical economic policy. Frankly, if you name anything after me, I'm for it. Yeah, seriously. this so. is an awful policy that we named capitalism, and he's all for it. So Absolutely, we found his weakness. Ben and Jerry, you want to give us a flavor that just tastes disgusting? Name it cast something, and we're on the board. Oh, I'm so there. Uh, Millie keeps going for the computer screen. She likes anything that's bright, and she doesn't understand that we are recording. Well, we will see how that plays out, and we'll probably get back to it next week. Let's move on to something you brought up yesterday, which I think was a great idea for a segment. What is American culture? What defines American culture? I think this is a fun time to do that. In America, is that it's, you know, more, more of a low point. But, uh, no, I think it's, we often talk about, you know, uh, foreign cultures, but what makes something um, uniquely American? And I think what brought this on is a friend recommended a restaurant, and the portions were so huge and it's like only in America. Yeah. And I, I got a little bit of weird pride about it. Like it's gross, but that's us. Yeah. yeah. Huge portions. Portion sizes is is, uh, is definitely American. Big portion sizes. Quanti- qu- qu- quantity over quality. Yeah. And I, I would say um, whether for good or for worse, a lot of I guess just big brand capitalism. So many like just brands have brought so much awareness to the American culture, so to speak. I mean, oh, brands sneaker are very culture. American. I mean, we basically every sport aside from soccer that has like created a culture spinoff of it. America, it, that's America's. America's doing it. Absolutely. Whether it be basketball, whether it be baseball. Do you think Coca Cola is still the most American brand? I don't know. I would say no, just because Coca Cola recently has specifically marketed themselves as like internationally accept everybody. That's good for them. But truck companies, any, any truck well, companies yeah. are the most American. Yeah, pickup trucks are extremely American. I, the only other place I can think of that has pickup trucks are Canada and Mexico. And yeah. That's a surely the proximity the thing. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see like I don't think of any other country and think of trucks, pickup trucks. No. That's uniquely American. And, I you know, you know, that. and it's not this whole country either. It's just, it's very much the middle and south of this country that just like you get yes. pickup even trucks. Even and the thing is, you, it's not like a. I wouldn't even say it's a big city rural divide because like if you go to Dallas or if you go. Oh yeah, they're everywhere. To Denver or Oklahoma City, which is the smallest of the three cities I just named, you're you're gonna see it's pickup regional. trucks. It's regional. It's regional, not. Uh, Urban. Oh, our producer is pulling out a <laughs> Seattle shirt. No, no trucks in Seattle? No trucks in Seattle. No. Zero. That's, yeah. that's exactly the point. Yeah. yeah. In uh, Washington and Oregon, there's probably not a lot of pickup trucks unless you live out in the country where you own a farm. But I bet it's not a cultural signal. No, that, that's there. function at that point. It's function, yeah. Yeah, here, here is an aesthetic. People yeah, love aesthetic. The yeah, people own trucks who shouldn't own trucks. Exactly. And I find it disgusting, but it, here we are. Well, uh, also, I mean... Just big budget, big box entertainment is like the superhero movies, sci-fi. Both of those are like things American, America pioneered, things that America, I mean, just Marvel. I mean, just the superhero story in general. Is Superheroes very are very American. Very American. Uh, superheroes, I think comic books, and I mean, I know comic books kind of like popped up everywhere at the same time, but they were, for lack of a better word, perfected in America. Right. Um like, and the only the only place you only other place you see them are places that like at least that are popular are places that were heavily influenced by American culture like Japan. Yes, yes, manga is a, well, that, and that's even not that's not even a comic book. That's a different medium, really. Right. Because you're telling a much longer story. Uh huh. It seems um, like an imitation of ours, and they kind of just became their own thing over the years. It became its own thing. Yeah, I wouldn't know, I I'm, I wouldn't go so far as say it's an imitation. I don't know the history, but Probably I would say first. that uh, it's certainly influenced by ours. But their style of storytelling is so different that um, where are my keys? Where are my keys? They are behind you. Fascinating. Apparently, the history of manga is said to originate from scrolls dating back to the 12th century. Well, how about that? So, very, very long. Yeah. 
Maybe it saw its resurgence once the world was ready for more comic book fever. Well, and that proves your point because America was founded, as we all know, in the 11th century. In the 11th century, yes. correct, correct. America is very old. America is oh, the don't oldest. Eat those little girl, don't eat those little girl. But yeah, I think comics and jazz, jazz are uniquely American art forms. So much of just the African American story and of them, like the more you know, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> So much of just the African American story and just them going through bondage and them, them coming out and just like everything their culture has expressed and then whether it be through discrimination and just backlash from like the white culture or whatever, just so much of what they have created is, is very essential to American culture, I believe, too. Like that that's uniquely American for bad. For bad, but it became a good thing. I mean, out of out of a great show. Out of pain. Out came of pain beauty, came. Yes. Yeah, it came great beauty. Came a group of people that are yeah. I've got, I really have a story to tell. Uh, jazz music and a lot well, of jazz things. is, of course, you know, a very it's it is. I said it wasn't a, a uniquely American art form, but you're right. It must be said that it is a uniquely African American art form. Right, it is. Um, and that, that spawned rock and roll. That spawned hip hop. It spawned yeah. pretty much everything. Yeah, it. no, I mean it, it is. It is. Yeah, it's the most American music. Is jazz. Uh, Hip hop is very American, but it's still rock and roll. Uh, we think of it more as a British creation, but it's extremely American because it's Chuck Berry and it's Elvis Presley. Oh yeah, and it's uh, Buddy Holly. But uh, jazz is the progenitor of all of that. And uh, I mean, the only reason the the biggest the biggest British like rock and roll stars all lived in port cities where they got American. Culture. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And well, and the other thing is, jazz can capture the spirit of anywhere in the United States: East Coast, True. West Coast, the the suburbs, the plains. The, oh, 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 oh. Just oh got Chandler just eyes. Chandler just picked up his baby, and she just started flailing, and uh, she's got an arm on her. Oh, would you like to talk? We got our oh, guest. Yeah, no, we're cool. ready for our interview. Amelia. All right, so people a lot of times they talk about 10 months, they talk about one year. No one really is talking about 11 months. Can you tell us about being 11 months old? Shed some light on this. <laughs> okay, no, interesting take. Uh, no, I, 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 about the profanity. I agree to an extent, um, but I think there's some nuance that she's missing. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, Millie, no, please, please continue. Millie, can you elaborate? <laughs> you see, now that makes sense. Though, no, okay, now I'm on, your, on the same page. Yeah. That's good. She, she, she's, she's very headstrong. She likes to jump, jump into things without fully explaining. But once she provides some flavor... I wonder where she gets that. Yeah. Oh, are you your daddy's daughter? That's your mommy's daughter, too. She is. Yeah. Mommy is very kind and very empathetic, which her dad is not. <laughs> her dad is not. You are not empathetic. Oh. I'm going to let you fall backward. Uh, okay. I have the possession. I have like the ability to understand empathy and like be like, oh, maybe you I know when you should be empathetic. Exactly, that's the difference. Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, it's the difference. Because I am just empathy and no logic whatsoever. No, it's okay. So, yeah. We need that. We balance it out. Anyway, uh, more on to what? What else is American specifically? Um, and obviously, like a lot of times. Uh, a lot of times when people have this conversation, they talk about like all the bad stuff, and that's obvious, and we, you know, it needs to be known. But this is me, who, if you've listened to this, you know, I'm, you know, pinko. I'd say the cultural so, revolution, very much so. Um, we have, well, like, just everything from like the hippie rebellion to like the actual way our country was founded to the spate of revolutions that took off in Europe after we. And guns, yes, of course, feel by guns. We'll get there. Sure. We'll get there. Yeah, I, I'd say just the concept of revolution in general is very American. Um, well, we're, we're, very, we're very much the little guy over the big guy. We've always been that way in our stories, the stories we like, even though consequently we are the big, we're the big guy yeah, in every aspect of the world. It's an interesting dichotomy because Americans do like stories where the little guy wins, but we have been the big guy since 1940, 1940, yeah. yeah. So we, uh, there's a cultural disconnect there. Uh, another thing about American stories is we like success stories. We don't, especially in our comedy, I, I, a lot of people compare the British office and the American office. The key difference between the two, and I'm not the first person to make this point, is in the British office, the main character, uh, Ricky Gervais's character, is an awful person. You want to see him fail. He needs to fail because he doesn't deserve to win. Whereas in the American office, Steve Carell's character, while repugnant at times, is still lovable. He has redeeming features. He's also really good at his job. 
Right, and that's the and that's about the only thing he's good at. Yeah, exactly. Where that, that's interesting. Is that at his job. We want to see him fail. We want to see him get crapped on. We secretly want to see Steve Carell's character succeed. Right. And that's the difference between American humor and the rest of the world. Is that's we very like, interesting. Yeah, like picture Joe Dirt. In any other country, the Joe Dirt, and I don't like Joe Dirt, but that character would have lost in the end. But in America, because we wrote the story, he is a success story, even though he is, you know, a loser. Yeah, no, she loves Joe Dirt. She was just cursing at you for for slandering for besmirching the good name of Joe Dirt and David Spade. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. She loves, she loves, she loves Spade. She's she's loved him since Cars, Trains, and Automobiles, or Cars, Planes, and Automobiles. Whatever Planes, Trains, called. and Automobiles. Whatever that movie's called, she knows. It's it. about a rat race. Yeah, no, no, no. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Isn't he in that? Or is <laughs> no, you're thinking of. Uh, I'm thinking of Tommy Boy, aren't I? You're thinking of Tommy Boy. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is Steve Carell and uh, not Steve Carell, Steve Martin. And um, the big guy, John Candy, not John Candy, John Candy, John Candy, yeah. What? what? And you got John Candy confused with uh, fan down by the river guy, uh, and because they're both fat. Um, fat Chris Farley. You got John Candy confused with Chris Farley. Fat phobia. You heard it. You heard it first year, folks. That's not. That's not what that was. But that's what happened in his mind. His unconscious mind connected John oh, yeah, Candy. They're the same person. They're both fat. A fatty. With, uh, who's the other guy? Chris Farley. Chris Farley, another fatty. We They're both fat. That's fine. We know that. We need to name this episode Fat Guy Down by the River. <laughs> fat that's Guy right. Down by the River. <laughs> How long has he been dead for? Well, that's worth a good one. Oh, not too long. I, I'm, I, what a great, what a great town. So funny. So funny. Both of them. Yeah, both of them. Why, are they them. both dead? Is John Candy dead? I'm pretty sure John Candy's dead. As they well. were both really fat. <laughs> Chris Farley died in... No, Chris Farley. Oh, 97. Chris Farley's been dead. Was his last movie that wilderness movie when he wore a hat? Maybe. I sound like a mom right now. I cannot. Oh, you playing with the phone? She found my phone. Oh, okay, yeah. They're both dead. (laughs) Well... American culture, we covered that... You know, the kind of reason we do a segue of one of the most American games... Ever in the nerdy portion of this podcast that I would like to talk about, Fallout. Fallout by Bethesda Games. Mm. Is dystopian fiction specifically American? No, the the fought the most dystopian novel is British, nineteen eighty four. Okay, yeah, Bethesda. Oh, last week was E three, and we learned a lot um, about a lot of different games. I'm not a gamer, but I like to pay attention to this stuff because I'm still like I think it's cool, but. Um, what what game released at E3 are you most excited for? Um, you know, I actually didn't really pay attention to it too much. Um, I'm actually really excited for Elder Scrolls Blades, the new phone game that's coming on to Elder Scrolls. I'm really excited for that. I don't want to play that Elder Scrolls on my phone. I want to play it on the TV, even if it's like a weak version. Like, I would play that game if it was like a... Ten dollar game I could buy on PlayStation Network, it's but I'm not the, playing it on my phone. It's coming to the Xbox and PlayStation. It is yeah. okay. Great, right. then I will play it. Interesting. Well, yeah, I'll probably play it on my phone. I got time to kill, stuff to do. Um, a lot of people are excited about Fallout 76. I'm very skeptical. I'm a big fan now, of. I, I, that Scrolls. looks cool. Why is everyone skeptical about it? Why was it different than other Fallout's? I played well because specifically the MMO feature, the mass uh, massively multiplayer online. That's what MMO stands for. Uh, it changes the games uh, for fans of Elder Scrolls, Skyrim, Oblivion, all that. Um, ESO, Elder Scrolls Online, came out and was the sixth incarnation of the game, and you lost a lot of the lore and just immersivity. Is that a word? It, it is, is now. It is now. Hey! All right. All right. Uh, you lost a lot of the lore and just immersiveness, immersivity of immersivity. the of the Elder Scrolls games um, whenever you're playing with other people because you walk around and be like, oh gosh, I'm going to this awesome temple and then you see someone like, I love Big Dog 43 come by and it's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm, re- I'm reminded I'm in the big world. I'm in the real world. Um, so you take that, take Fallout, which was another one that was just like a real immersive first player RPG. Uh, I don't know. I think it's going to kind of, um, I don't know. I feel like it's a cop out by the developers who don't have to make as much content because the online players themselves will provide content for other players. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, is it like exclusively multiplayer? Can you play? I believe so. Producing oh, all the okay. way in. 
you can play solo, but there's no such thing as a not online game. Okay, okay. Oh, so it's always online. Right. Yes. Why is that appealing to gamers? Some players, That sounds awful to me. Some people who have a strong community that they always game with, or a couple of friends that they always game with, um, I mean, it's just nice to be able to, be able to always get on with them. I, I play Destiny, and I enjoyed that about Destiny, because I played Destiny with a couple of close friends. I played ESO with my cousin, and it was fun, because we would we play it all the time. <coughs> but <coughs> for people, just your average gamer, your average gamer who doesn't necessarily have me. someone he wants to play yeah. with, them, yeah, that's not appealing to them. It's not. I don't, you know, want You that. want the immersive world. You want the one-player experience that you can pause, right? Yeah, because here's what I do when I game. I pull out Skyrim maybe once a month and play for three hours at a time, and that's enough for me. Uh, occasionally, I game, wish that was me. Oh, my gosh. Uh, sometimes a game will pique my interest. Like, okay, like uh, in the early 2000s, I really loved those Katamari Damacy games. Oh, yeah. Uh, the ones that were rolling around. Those were the best. Those were the best. And kill people for some reason. Like, it's this really bright, beautiful world where you destroy it. And, uh, but yeah, that's basically... <coughs> okay, so in the defense of Fallout 76, it is pretty much the size of West Virginia. Holy moly. So, so you're never going to find anyone. Well, no, you won't. It's, it's not exactly the size of so the major areas. It's four <coughs> times... Exactly. It's she four, gets it. Four times the size of the previous map from Fallout 4. And the Which max amount of people map. on the server is... That guesstimate rumored to be between 24 and 32 so 24 people even on fallout 4's servers would have been like you're lucky to see them yeah that's pretty big okay so it's going to be separated by servers it's not going to be like destiny where it's just one massive world and everyone's separated by instances no it will most likely be like destiny in fact that's what i've been relating it to most is that the open world travel is probably going to be very destiny like okay i mean that makes sense Instance, instances is a good way to kind of Cut down server traffic. Well, let's launch into. I uh, went to Cass's partner, Matt. Um, he was on last week's episode. He had a party. He had a summer ween party. And I was there and we were hanging out. And I went home from that party and I decided to play Fallout. And I was looking at my new character and I was like, you know what? I'm going to make this new character Cass. <laughs> so I named my new character Cass of the Wasteland. And I have been playing with them, and I've been trying to make, uh, of course, Fallout, like all good Bethesda games, you take a lot of choices based on ethics and what you think your character will do, what interests you. I've been trying to make my character very, very cast-like. So Um, your character, you're playing the character as if it would do what I would do. Yes, yes. In real life. Yes. Wow, okay. That's flattering. Yeah, uh, I, I have five but Chandler characters, and they're all different port, they're all different parts, portions of Chandler. Last one I played was was Chandler unhinged, and he just killed everybody. He actually violated a lot of missions and ended them early, and I couldn't finish the game because I killed too many. People. <laughs> so I decided to go for something a little bit different. Um, so you don't know too much about Fallout Four, do you? I know bits and piece, pieces. So, uh, so we need a way out. Yeah, no, he's angry there. about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bone up on it. Good. So let's let's uh, just remain this a podcast slash I guess crowd crowdsourcing project. Um, you play Fallout Three a little bit. What would you use post apocalyptic world? You have access to guns, laser guns, and melee weapons. What are you using? I think you know the weapon of my of what weapon of choice I would use. Sickle. Because <laughs> I'm a lefty. Uh, Communist. No, come on, no, come on. What are, what, are we ta- no, what are we talking about today? What are we, my weird habit that I do at night when I'm alone with a glass of wine. I put on YouTube. Oh, that's right. Yes. You can get those. Cass yeah. likes to watch nuclear explosions. For hours. <laughs> so you can get, there is a, um, they like to go back into the details. So like it's set in 2077 is when the world ended. And so like it's like 200 years after that. And like. So, America's in this huge war with China, and one of the things they invented towards the end of that war was called the Fat Man. They have these little mini nukes, and mm-hmm. you can launch them with a catapult. So, once I get one of those, it takes a while to get one, I will constantly keep it in your inventory. That is, that would be my, like, even if it's right next to me, I would die to use that weapon. Okay, cool. Yeah, the Fat Man is my favorite weapon from Fallout. Hands down. <coughs> there is an enemy called a... Um, Super, super mutant, mutant, super yeah. mutant suicider that specifically oh. wears a mini nuke on his chest and just runs in and blows himself up. Where's it on his hand? 
Does he wear those hands? Yep. Okay. Oh, oh Predator style. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is precious. Millie likes Super Mutants. She can't do anything um, wrong, can she? No, she really can't. I she, didn't think so. She prefers Synths. She likes the Institute a lot because she's a, a soulless science baby. Then tell me, where, would I st- where do I stand on the Brotherhood of Steel? You, I don't think you would like the Brotherhood of Steel, but that, right, that's, of course, a fair question. Right, I too much. I, I think you would like the Institute... You would either hate the Institute or you would love the Institute. Now, the Institute I don't know about. What's the Institute? Okay, so the Institute is, and of course, to avoid, I guess, copyright lawsuits, they um, they created the Commonwealth Institute of Technology. It's MIT. Oh, okay. They went underground at the end, some scientists, and they kept digging deeper and deeper. And eventually they started working on all this like really advanced robotic research that they were working on before the war. And they created these things called synths that are basically, like, they're androids. Like, they look human. They've got the point where they, like, they... Okay, yeah, you're right. You're right. They, uh, they look human. Um, they, they have, like, skin covering, and um, they have, I guess, human personalities and whatnot. Blood model decoys, synthesoids. Um, yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. Know, and it, it takes a while for them to get yeah. there. But one of, the big, brain. one of the big things becomes, like, these things are, like, they, they feel alive. And so... They, the institute is using them to advance their goals, which is basically kind of taking over the Commonwealth, so to speak. And there's a group that opposes them. It's kind of an abolitionist group called the Railroad, which was where I initially kind of I kind of hinted towards going, pushing it towards the Railroad. I was like, Cass would free some from robots. And then I wasn't sure though. I was I was like, I don't know if Cass would free. Yeah, robots. you're wondering if I'm a I'm a humanist or if I'm a transhumanist. Yeah, That's what yeah, you're yeah, basically. Yeah. You want to know? Yeah, what I'm gonna tell you. I'm a transhumanist. Yeah, hook me up to the computer. Let robots take over. That is fine. Okay, That's fine by me. If it is better and more efficient than people and can feel and has emotions, then it's fine. Go for it. Okay, so hook me up. up. Yeah, cast me on transhumanist. Um, okay. So you were railroad probably over uh, the institute, even though the institute. So minor spoilers. So you you get put in a vault if you remember Fallout at the yeah. end of the game. So you get put in a vault uh, in a vault this one, and you are you are frozen, and you are like from before the war. You remember before the war. You're frozen for like two hundred years. Damn. So they wake you up halfway through, and they take your son. Ah. Oh. Your baby boy son, and you later find out when you're interacting with the institute that that happened about eighty years ago. You were still frozen. They took your son, and he grew up to become the leader of the Institute. So he is the leader of these robot-making people. And that, of course, influenced the decisions of my original place. So I was like, oh, this is my son. Hell yeah, I'm going to help him. So do you think you would have helped them if it was your son? If it was my son? I would always side with my son, I imagine. I don't, I don't have any kids, but I have a dog, and I think that's the same thing. It is. It yeah. Is the same so thing. I would, if my dog wanted to, you know, rob a bank, I'd help him out. Okay. So whatever my son is doing, I'd probably do it. So let's put possible on the institute. This is getting complicated. Um, <laughs> so then we have. We I have. Feel like this is very niche, but Fallout's really popular, so that's yeah. cool. All right, back up, back up, back up. Millie is pulling out the cord. Um, she does not like the machines. No, she does not. She's not care for them. She is joining. She is joining the institutes so she can enslave them. Um, so then we got Brotherhood of Steel, which you don't care for. You already kind of know that from playing Fallout Three. Um, then we have the Minutemen, who is what I was leaning towards, and I've already started to do some side missions for them. The Minutemen are basically this group of like tough patrolmen that protect everyone and they're kind of like they create these collectivist communities like across the map and you can kind of build up and recruit people to it collectivist I mean, it, 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 yeah, it yeah. instantly seems like some ANCOM stuff so <laughs> I, yeah that was, that was where I eventually went but at the end of the day I guess does your, does your heart lie more with the ANCOMs or does it lie more with the, the abolitionists probably abolitionists okay okay probably. Yeah, I. Yeah. Okay, we, we can we can end this playthrough with the railroad. Uh, we we can do that. Yeah. You know, the railroad's interesting. Based on what you've told me about these factions, I think that's probably where I would end up. Uh, I'll tell you, if this helps, I'm with the Stormcloaks when I play Skyrim. Does that help at all? Kind of. I know it's completely different kind, kind of, of like setup and. <coughs> that surprises me. You think I'd be an Imperial? Yeah. Order. Oh man, you gotta volunteer for subjugation. You can't like, you gotta, you gotta want it. 
And if, okay. if people want to be free, they deserve to be free. Okay. I if I would, that. Also, this might help too. If I lived in Scotland, I would be a member of the SNP, the Scottish National Party. I would want to free Scotland, get them out of the, the uh, okay. UK. But ironically, put them in the EU. So. So not free. Uh, <laughs> God, freaking <laughs> <Christ. laughs> Well, alrighty. I um I think that we will try to plan later this month. We're going to do a little console swap a um, So Cass can have my PS4 for a couple of weeks and play Fallout 4 and see what he thinks. And I kind of want to play one of the older games that I've never gotten to play. He has Fallout 3 for the PlayStation 3. I never played Fallout 3. I played New Vegas. But yeah, our producer looked at me in shock and is now tis- tisking his fingers. That's a bad act for you. Thank you. Why don't you pull up Grinder? I mean, I don't have Grinder. <laughs> Suspicious, suspicious no from Cass. Yeah, that's not Grinder. I'm not, not grinder. I'm not a grinder guy. I'm not a grinder guy. Well, um, I think that was a good pod. That was a wrap. Let's talk wrap, more Fallout. Wrap, wrap it up. Next week. And, uh, Millie, thank you for being our guest. You were just lovely. No, I think we'll have you back for sure. And if we ever need someone to fill in, I, I would hope you'd be willing to take up that space. Okay, guys, thank you so much. That's how she's going to talk. I'm Millie. I'm Millie. Perfect.